I'm uh, Noel Latif, president of the Foreign Policy Association, and I'm delighted that we are co-sponsoring uh, with SUNY this centennial global engagement lecture. I cannot think of anybody more qualified to deliver this lecture than Professor Michael Doyle, who serves on the Foreign Policy Association's editorial advisory board and who, uh, of course, teaches at Columbia University. When I explained uh, to the folks at Delta Airlines uh, that Michael would be speaking on the new model international mobility convention, uh, they readily agreed to underwrite the publication uh, of the book that will compile this and other lectures uh, marking FPA's centenary. We could have no better partner uh, than uh, Ilgu Osler, a uh, professor here at SUNY. And I am delighted to turn to Ilgu to formally introduce uh, Professor Doyle. Ilgu. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, SUNY Global Center uh, for this exciting evening for me with Professor Michael Doyle. It's just, I'm going to mirror what you're saying. Um, I'm the director of the SUNY Global Engagement Program in New York City. This is a semester long program uh, in fall semesters and we are in our fifth year where our students come to New York City to immerse themselves in global affairs in or near the United Nations, and they also do a seminar and a research colloquium with me, and we are all about immersing ourselves in the action uh, around the UN, right? Uh, my students are all in the audience. And we have our sister group here, BGIA students, and Professor um, Jim Ketterer, who is uh, the dean of... Um, I don't even know your title, Jim, but so, yeah. Jim, Jim, Jim does everything at BGIA, so I'm so grateful that you brought your students here to hear this amazing um, uh, lecture by Michael Doyle, and I know it's going to, be, going to be amazing because I've heard him speak at other occasions. Um, I want to thank the SUNY Global Center for providing us this room and this building. Uh, we appreciate them for hosting us. Uh, before I introduce the speaker tonight, I want to also thank Noel. Um, Noel has been a friend of us from the beginning. The SUNY Global Engagement Program, as I was beginning this program, I had a meeting in his office and I said, um, I'm thinking about doing this. Will you take some of my students? And he said, of course I will take your students. And not only did he take them, and now I think Cole is working for him, right? So, um, so it, it has been a really good partnership that we've had, and he always is very generous inviting us to all their events. So thank you, Noel, um, and um, thank you, Adam and, and Cole, for all your work uh, in this. Um, and through uh, you know, Foreign Policy Association and we have, uh, you know, I have a vision for the Global Engagement Program and we have found our overlapping um, interest, I think, at the United Nations. Um, we both have goals of informing, inspiring, engaging citizens on global issues. And I think that there is nowhere uh, more important and more crucial today than ever than the United Nations. And uh, Michael Doyle is the perfect speaker for this event because um, he is the director of Columbia Global Policy Initiative and the university professor of Columbia University. And he has been on my syllabus for my UN semester class uh, that I have been teaching for the past 12, 13, 14, I don't know, some, some years, right? So the course that I teach in the spring semesters is a UN semester class. So this is a class where three credits takes place on campus, but for three credits, I take the students down to the United Nations to hear briefings from UN officials, country missions, and non-governmental organizations. And um, for 10 Fridays, so 30 briefings, so I've been through, what, 360 briefings at the UN at this point, right? Um, um, so. What we do then in this class is a cross between academic thought and practice, trying to figure out how do we take this academic thought we have about the 
global governance into practice. And I cannot think of a more suitable academic to, to invite to talk in uh, a series that I'm trying to organize than Professor Doyle, because he is the person who crosses that boundary uh, no better than anyone else. And um, Professor Doyle, uh, Doyle's research interests include international relations theory, international law, international peace building, and the United Nations. And his most recent book is The Question of Intervention by Yale University Press. So students, buy it, read it. Um, so, but from 2006 to 2013, Professor Doyle was an individual member and a chair of the UN Democracy Fund, a fund established in 2005 by the UN General Assembly to promote grassroots democratization around the world, uh, which is, I think, one of the most important projects that we can take up um, uh, in the world. Doyle previously, this is what we discussed in class today, didn't we? All right, good. Doyle previously served as Assistant Secretary General and a Special Advisor for Policy Planning to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. He's worked very closely with uh, Secretary General on, the, on this, um, and, and he has received two career awards from uh, American Political Science Association. That's dear to my heart because I'm a political scientist. And um, one is for his scholarship and one is for his public service. So, so he crosses these two worlds in an amazing way. And, and believe me, not many political scientists do this well. And so um, thank you. Thank you for your great work. Um, so I'm going to, uh, he's also on the board of the International Peace Institute. Two of our GEP uh, students are working there now. So I'm very excited about that. <laughs> and a member of the editorial advisory committee of The Great Decision, which is a publication of the Foreign Policy Association and uh, I cannot wait to hear what you have to say, Professor Doyle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, Professor Hugo Asser, thank you so much for that generous uh, introduction. I, I don't think I can live up to it, so please forget the introduction. and Let's start fresh from right now. I'm also really delighted to be here in connection with the Foreign Policy Association. This is a centennial lecture, and it means that for a hundred years, the Foreign Policy Association has been campaigning brilliantly to educate the American public about the role that the United States uh, can and should play in the world around us. Uh, we cannot be ostriches burying our head in the sand. We have to know the world and be able to express the best of what America is all about to that world. And there's been no group more than the Foreign Policy Association, now led brilliantly by Noel Latif, that has been dedicated to that mission. Now, the work has got harder recently, we know, but the resources are there to uh, make all that difference. So, with these two contexts, I'm so pleased to be here. My, my theme this evening is the Model International Mobility Convention. Uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about the existing regimes for migrants and refugees and some of the genuine problems that are associated with these two regimes and then trying to make a case to you for a new legal architecture for migration and refugees. And I, I wind up with a invitation to you to sign this new architecture, this new model international mobility convention, if you find it persuasive. I think in front of everyone is a two-page summary of the convention, uh, a list of our commissioners who collectively uh, negotiated and wrote this convention, and then there's a link there that takes you right to the page at which you can sign if you are so moved. So there's three steps to my uh, uh, talk this evening. The first is I want to begin with the current challenges of, the, of migrants and refugees, the current refugee and migration challenge. Then I want to note some limitations in the two global treaties that regulate uh, refugee protection and international migration, and explain how this model international mobility convention, summarized in front of you, addresses those challenges. 
fills in some gaps that I think very much need to be filled in. And then I'm going to conclude with remarking on certain special features attached to the convention, its scope, its comprehensive quality, the cumulative uh, aspect of the rights that are embedded within it, the methodology, compliance, and then a conclusion. So what are the current challenges for refugees and migrants? Today, there are about 244 million migrants in the world. In the UN terms, a migrant is somebody outside his or her country of origin for at least a year. Uh, the nation, let's call it that, of migrants is the fifth most populous nation in the world, uh, just below Indonesia, just above Brazil, if we add up all of these 244 million. Equally significant, there are 1.2 billion visitors each year in recent years. That's a vastly larger sum than the number of migrants. And I want you to remember that because they also need to be part of the architecture of how, when people move across borders. Now, the number of migrants have grown significantly in the past few years, but not, not, in, not in ways that take it beyond the overall growth of global population. And moreover, even though this is somewhat new, the increased numbers, in the longer term perspective, not really that new at all. Migrants still constitute about 2 to 4 percent of the global population, not much more than that. And human beings basically have been defined by migration. Our very origins, a hundred and some thousand years ago, our ancestors poured out of Africa and migrated to begin to settle the globe. We, we, we as human beings are people in motion and have long been so. And that's worth remembering. Today, about two-thirds of international migrants live in uh, Europe, Asia, North America, in that order. Most migrants come, you won't be surprised to hear, from India, then Mexico, then Russia, China, Bangladesh, and other countries. They make crucial contributions to innovation and productivity in all of our economies. That's the good news. The unfortunate news is that many governments feel that they've lost control of their borders. Uh, undoubtedly an exaggeration if we look at the reality, but that perception is quite real and some voters share that perception. And undocumented migrants are too often subject to exploitation. Even more unfortunately, human mobility, the movement of people across borders, includes 22 million refugees and 3 million asylum seekers. Over half the refugees are 18 or under. So it means that we're dealing with a young population out there. Unless they get a home and education, this is not going to be a happy generation. And it could be a very angry generation. Driven by from their homes by civil wars, 2014 saw the largest increase in the numbers of displaced in a single year nearly double the numbers seen in the previous decade. So there were some changes, especially on the humanitarian side of the movement of people. And this is a level not seen since World War II. And these numbers continued to climb in 2015 before they went somewhat down. Confounding this problem of refugees, that is what it means for them, is that the number of refugees returning home is at a 30 year low. So the numbers of refugees increasing through 2015 and those able to go back home were at a low that has not been seen in a long time. And to add further to the challenge, 84% of the forcibly displaced are being housed by and hosted by developing countries such as Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, Ethiopia, Kenya. And moreover, the typical displacement last 20 years. So it's not as if this is a short run phenomena and then people go back home. Instead, people are being displaced for their homes for 20 years and most of them are young. So get you, we, it lets us wrap our minds around the kinds of challenges that are now being faced. The international community has approached this problem. On 19th of September and the 20th of September last year, there were two summits. 
one hosted by President Obama, the Leaders Summit, at which he assembled a group of heads of government who pledged more resources and more resettlement opportunities for refugees. Some of those promises, we have to say, most, most significantly, of course, Mr. Obama's promises are not being kept. They're being rolled back quite significantly. Uh, the, the next day on the, excuse me, the day before, on the 19th of September, the UN hosted its own summit, brought together again uh, leaders, foreign ministers, and others, and heads of government, to look at the questions of protection for refugees and uh, safe, orderly, and regular migration. Both of these were parts of the agenda. It was a, a striking meeting, but frankly, um, most of the hard diplomatic work was postponed at the UN General Assembly meeting, postponed until 2018, when these leaders made a, a promise that they would address three questions. They would adopt a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration to deal with the migration issue with some guidelines and shared principles and approaches. Second, they would develop guidelines on the treatment of migrants in vulnerable situations. Think unaccompanied children that are crossing borders. And thirdly, they would seek to achieve a more equitable sharing of the burden and responsibility for hosting and supporting the world's refugees by adopting a global compact on refugees by 2018. So two compacts, one for migration, one for refugees are being promised, and these are now in the process of being negotiated. Uh, the refugee one being led by UNHCR and the migration one being led by co-facilitators from Switzerland and Mexico. These are big promises, and the, the question that we face now is, will these promises be delivered upon? And that's going to require leadership. It's going to re require reform coalitions to come together. But in the meantime, a group of 30 or so uh, experts from around the world, a, a commission, a self-appointed commission, got together and sought to develop new sensible standards to shape the movement of people across borders. And this is that model international mobility convention that you see in front of you. To contribute to uh, these standards, the commission focused on the gaps and flaws in two landmark treaties. The first being the Refugee Convention of 1951 with the 1967 protocol that globalizes it. The second being the Migrant Labor Convention of 1990. Now, some gaps in the world of movement across borders, we know we cannot address this is because they, they, they track the world that we're in and its non-changeable aspects. We live in an incoherent world, uh, a world of sovereign states in which everyone has the right to leave a country and no one has the right to enter a country without its specific uh, permission, or unless there's some special treaty regime as exists, for example, in Europe for a cross-border movement. So everyone has a right to leave. No one has a right to enter. That's the world that we live in. And that, that's a deeply ingrained part and parcel of the fact that we live in a world of sovereign states. But these refugee treaties and the migration treaties, they can be improved. We're not going to get to the the larger point of the incoherence, but the true trees can be. Let me give you some problems in the 51 Convention, otherwise a wonderful landmark of human rights. Uh, the global response to the Holocaust and the failure to provide asylum and refuge to the people persecuted by the Nazis, the, the door, the barn door, so to speak, is now closed or open, stretching the metaphor, and that, that horrible neglect is now being addressed in this 51 convention. But nonetheless, having said that, it is a wonderful convention. There's still some problems attached to it. There's a narrow definition of the grounds for protection. You have to be persecuted because of race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. Those are the grounds that you have to be able to document or prove in order to get uh, asylum in a country in which you're applying for refugee status. But what about equal threats to life coming from starvation, severe droughts, generalized civil war, or generalized violence? 
they don't qualify automatically within the terms of those 51 standards that have been set up. In the 51 treaty, you have a right to non-refoulement, that is not to be expelled to a country once you arrive, but no right to arrive and make a claim. Again, there are these catch-22s built into the legal architecture. Once you gain protected status in a country, your rights are equivalent to other aliens, not to nationals, which provide all sorts of potential restrictions. Now, I have to say that many governments are more protective than the 51 Convention. Thank goodness. That is, they're more generous in their humanitarian protection that is embodied in the 51 Convention. But there isn't a common floor. And many, some countries are much less generous. And we need to define a more coherent and credible common floor. And that's what we attempt to do as part of this model international mobility convention. We broaden the grounds for asylum. We define this as forced migrant is someone who's threatened, who's, who has to flee because there's a threat to life or arbitrary incarceration. And so refugees become a subset of the forced migrant category. Second of all, for refugees and forced migrants in this new treaty, we provide rights equivalent to nationals rather than to aliens so that certified credentialed refugees can get a job rather than having to wait a number of years, can send their kids to school, can have access to medical uh, provisions that are available to citizens. And that's a, a significant step forward. We specify that there is a right to enter and be assessed for refugee status to make the claim if you're fleeing directly from persecution or a threat to life or serious harm, if the rest of the provisions of the treaty are also in place, including uh, arrangements for genuine shared responsibility, so that the responsibility of caring for refugees is not just upon the developing countries that currently hold most, or a few developed countries like Germany, for example, who in an act of generosity uh, welcomed uh, refugees flowing into its country in 2015. This is a responsibility that needs to be globally shared. When globally shared, the burden is much, much less and the responsibility is real for all. Once that's in place, then you have a right to make a claim if you come directly from a, a, a situation in which your life is being threatened by causes external to yourself. So those are some of the major changes that we have embedded in this, and there are many others. You'll see a full summary in front of you as you, read, as you take a look at it. Let's now shift to labor, that is, to people moving in a, uh, in a, on a more voluntary basis across borders. There, the big legal convention is the 1990 Migrant Workers Convention, which has a number of valuable provisions in it, including the rights to participate in unionization, having equal pay to nationals for the same work, access to the legal process if you're charged with a crime. There are a number of useful parts of that treaty. But it's not a very effective treaty. It has, with two very small exceptions, no ratifications from countries of, of net immigration. And the purpose of the treaty is to protect migrants in, in countries they move to. And no countries of net immigration, countries of destination, have signed and ratified the treaty. So literally, it is not working in the way it was designed to. And that's a significant problem. To give you some of difficulties in more particular, temporary migrants, that is those coming to work for a set period of time on a particular job, have both too many rights and too few rights. Too many rights is that in that 1990 convention, they're given rights to education, social housing, university education, et cetera. That means that many countries are unwilling to expand the number and kinds of migrants whom they're being willing to import to do work because they're afraid that it's going to be a burden on social protections and social welfare spending. So that's too bad. There are missed opportunities. People who want to work, countries that might be willing to have them. And then on the other hand, there are too few rights 
for these temporary, uh, temporary workers. Uh, they need to have access to multiple visas that are not provided in the 1990 convention. They need portable pensions. So pensions they earn, they can take back to their country when their work is done. And there needs to be provisions to make sure that you don't become a permanent temporary worker. That is that you get assessed for a uh, permanent resident, permanent uh, resident and, and labor status after a set period of years. And that we need, we do embed in the treaty. Other things that we add in that are not in the Migrant Workers Treaty, uh, really important categories for other people who move across borders, visitors, short-term visitors, tourists, uh, uh, students, international students who move across borders. We create floor level protections, defining rights and expectations, and duties on the part of governments and universities, duties and rights on the part of students in order to broaden a framework for those who move across borders. Okay, um, so that's what the treaty is about. What are some of the special features of this treaty that I'd like to draw to your attention before I wrap up and welcome your questions and comments? One is that this convention in front of you is comprehensive and it's a cumulative ladder of rights and duties. That is, we cover everything from visitors, short-term uh, people moving across a border, through tourists and students, labor migrants, uh, temporary long-term investors, residents, retirees who might go to settle in another country, forced migrants and convention refugees. We also look at the needs of the trafficked, for example. So what you see there is a series of different levels of people that have reasonable grounds for more attention and humanitarian concern. A visitor visiting a country for a short term, all he, he or she needs is to have access to the courts and to make sure that they're not discriminated against arbitrarily in any way. But as you move through each of those other categories, tourists, students, labor migrants, investors, et cetera, you need to have more rights, more protections, so that you can be safe in the work that you're doing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a variety covering the various different ways in which people do move across borders with a cumulative ladder, if you will, or a cumulative set of steps providing more rights for each category, for each specific category that are needed for this to become a framework that provides the kind of protections that are necessary for those different groups to move safely and productively across borders. The methodology. Uh, this was a single text, which, which you'll see if you go to the website, negotiated by a commission of 30 plus experts from around the world. They included uh, eminent scholars and practitioners, uh, uh, an old friend, Alex Olenikoff, the former deputy head of UNHCR, Francois Crepeau, you'll see on the, on the list in the back, the rapporteur on the rights of migrants, Guy Goodwin Gill from the Refugee Studies Center, Oxford, Susan Martin, Joel Trackman, Randall Hansen, Halid Kozer, Parvati Nair, Don Kerwin, Ray Kozlowski, Tendaya Chume. These are a group of leading scholars specializing in both migration and refugee rights. And they spent two years uh, in person and online through video meetings negotiating sometimes in you know we, we didn't all come in thinking the same way about everything there were some hard negotiations that took place and in a couple cases some serious voting and the majority won and that's how this treaty was put together so it's a negotiated document we also immensely benefited from the research and hard work of Kieran Banerjee and Emma Bornyas and Maggie Powers, all of whom made this possible, two of whom are seated right over there. Uh, this, this was a long and, uh, and, and uh, sometimes tiring process. So what's, what's the normative methodology? Well, uh, this is designed to be a realistic utopia, by which I mean it's designed to reflect the world as it is and build in a movement toward justice that actually existing but perhaps better motivated governments might someday be prepared to sign. 
No governments have signed up to this yet. We're only talking to uh, uh, academics, to students, to NGOs, leaders in civil society. But eventually, if it does get some momentum behind it, we will bring it to governments, but not right now. This is designed to be a, a treaty for uh, a future, uh, a bit utopian, but at the same time, one that governments could sign if they were better motivated. It does not uh, correspond to existing treaty commitments. It goes beyond them. This is a significant change in reform. So it's no objection to our document to say that it's different from existing law. It's supposed to be. It would be an objection if you felt that this is not what the law should be. This is normative in that sense. In practical terms, think of this as a treaty written for uh, the Justin Trudeau could sign. Now, maybe not too many other prime ministers would, but we're hoping that Justin Trudeau would find a lot of this uh, persuasive. Let me talk about compliance now. How do we get reasonable compliance given this significant expansion of rights that's embedded into this treaty? We are strengthening various elements of human rights for all those who are crossing borders. No question about it. It's ambitious in that way. And it applies to any refugee or migrant. So it's designed to provide rights that will make the lives of all refugees and all migrants better, whether their home country ratifies it or not. So this is designed to provide no reduction and an expansion of rights. So the biggest winners in this treaty, of course, are vulnerable people in the mobile. Uh, they will like this treaty is our expectation, but they can't enforce it. And they can't, you know, make sure that it really works in the world. So what we build in are reciprocal benefits into this treaty that will tempt the powerful uh, and the wealthy uh, to wealthy states to regard this as a step forward. For the countries that are hosting refugees, mostly developing countries, there are big advantages here that will tempt in good ways, the Jordans, the Turkeys, the Pakistans, the Kenyas, and others, because of the responsibility sharing mechanism that requires all countries to bear their fair share of the cost of providing refuge for refugees on a global basis. So that's going to be very tempting to Turkey, Jordan, and Egypt, and many others. For countries of destination, uh, like the U.S. and the EU, that some parts of this treaty are going to be very attractive. We will gain laborers, that often that provide labor flexibility in many industries. We'll gain investors. We have rules that will make it easier for investors to invest across borders with transparency, no more secret deals, bargains taking place. And this is a, a significant improvement. For countries concerned about their national security, uh, if you sign this treaty, you need to make a commitment that you will help introduce machine-readable and biometric passports for your country with the help of those countries that first require it. So countries will know who's crossing their border much more effectively than they do today. Uh, it's, not as, it's not as bad as the Attorney General said this morning in terms of the loss of our border control, but he's right that there are issues that could significantly be improved. Lastly, there's diffuse re uh, reciprocity as well as specific reciprocity. We're creating a better set of regimes that will allow mobility to flourish in ways that could uh, uh, contribute to global prosperity. The travel and tourism industry is a $7 trillion industry. That's with a T, $7 trillion. 10% of global GDP, 277 million jobs worldwide. We're trying to provide better, clearer, coherent legal framework underlying that in this treaty. International education, that is students coming across borders to study in another university, is in the U.S. alone a $32 billion industry, uh, providing 400,000 jobs. So it's a very significant presence. And again, we're providing clear rules of responsibility and rights that will make it flourish, in our view. But we recognize that it's not going to be purely self-interest that's going to drive this treaty. Like many human rights treaties, it's going to have to appeal 
to ethical solidarity. It'll have to appeal to common decency and ethical responsibility backed up with a bit of naming and shaming as many other human rights treaties do. So what does that mean? Well, I was, in, I was inspired um, a number of months ago when I found something by William Shakespeare, you know, this is the, the trot out your Shakespeare moment. And it's something that he wrote in 1590, and it was for a play called The Book of Sir Thomas More. He wasn't the major author. He was called in, in Hollywood terms, to be a script doctor, to fix up a lousy play and make it more interesting. And we know that he wrote this one section that I'm going to read to you in just a moment. And for the Shakespeare buffs in the room, it's the only piece of, of playwriting that we have in a handwriting that's identical to the William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon. So that William Shakespeare's handwriting matches this handwriting and that's the only manuscript that we have that does that, I've been told by the Shakespeare scholars. But that's not the point. The point is, is that he's talking about Sir Thomas More speaking to rioters in London who had rioted against refugees, and they're driving them out. This is the story of the play. And I quote, this is the, the, the part of it. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coast for transportation. Shakespeare continues, what if your monarch, the monarch of your country, were to banish you? Whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal? nay, anywhere that not adheres to England? Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainous inhumanity speaking to the rioters. So that was Shakespeare's take on why we have a moral duty, a solidarity, to provide the kind of hospitality, the kind of welcome, the kind of refuge, that if we, in some cases, were in similar trouble, we would desperately pray for. So that's, th these kind of protections won't come unless that also resonates with our publics. So let me conclude. We'll be publishing this treaty in the Journal of Transnational Law with a whole set of commentaries coming this November. I recommend that to you. If all goes well over the next year, the commissioners in various different meetings just like this one will be explaining what we're trying to do, create some awareness of the treaty, hopefully mobilizing support, maybe persuading some people that it's worth signing on to. And we will do that, and then we'll share it with UNHCR, IOM, International Organization of Migration, ILO, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, various key NGOs and civil society actors, again, trying to build some awareness and support for this. The value of the treaty is that it allows us to identify a better future regime for migration. We can address some of the frequently noted but not filled sad gaps in the two key legal instruments, the 51 Convention and the 1990 Migrant Workers Convention. We hope we've got a, a framework in which the, a regime that is comprehensive and cumulative has a coherence to it that will appeal to those who look at it. Uh, and that the language we use is action, rights, and duties oriented. We want to display what a better regime for migration would look like. And we hope to take away the undue concerns that some of publics have about what it would be like to have a law and order related regime for the movement of people across borders. And we hope if, in some respects also to inspire. We, we know that the times are not auspicious for this kind of, of an endeavor, and neither in the United States, nor in Europe, nor really anywhere else. Uh, this is something that we're doing for the next hopeful 10 or 15 years, when moods and commitments, et cetera, we hope change more in this direction. 
But we hope that by doing some of the hard work of sorting out uh, a more coherent regime for migration, that will make the work of the diplomats easier when they get around to providing a better regime for migration. And in the meantime, we're working closely with the, the Global Compact on Refugees team and with the Global Compact on Migration, feeding some of these ideas to them to see if they might find you know, some of the parts, if not the whole, useful in the very practical work they're attempting to do by 2018. So I wrap up by saying that uh, I hope you will read the summary. I hope you will follow the link. If you like the treaty, I really do hope that you will sign it and that the, uh, uh, the movement begins here, so to speak. So thank you very much. And I welcome your comments. And questions. So I will tell everybody that there is a button in front of you for those of you who would like to ask questions. Um, and uh, after you're done with your question, please turn off the button because we can hear you speak if you don't <laughs> turn off the button. Um, and I will take the liberties to ask the first question. Sure. So I, this is fascinating. Uh, this is exactly what we were talking about in our class today, right? The democratizing impact of global civil society. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, um, as experts, you have, uh, you have kind of taken this initiative to contribute to this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering about, I have a couple of questions. One is that what are some of the issues that, that you had to vote on? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to come to an agreement, mm -hmm. um, we, bec because that is really contentious. Yes. Um, the second is, how did you handle the question of, you, you said that for, I, and I haven't read the text fully, so mm -hmm. uh, for countries of destination, you said to gain laborers and investors, right? For those countries of third country settlements, mm -hmm. gaining laborers and investors is an attractive solution, mm -hmm. but for those countries that are, losing those laborers and just having left behind those mm -hmm. people we, with low education who may not be able to contribute as well, you know, how do you make that argument that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's okay to let them go, mm -hmm. which right now we, we, we yes. we're witnessing in Turkey, for example, if you're too educated, mm -hmm. the Turkish government is not letting you go um, uh, as a refugee. So um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you address yeah. that question. No, those are both great questions. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we had many differences, uh, as naturally you would putting together a group of diverse uh, experts from around the world. And we usually were able to, you know, find some uh, common ground, a way to bring the vast majority of the people on board. One of the most difficult issues we faced was with regard to forced migrants and refugees. The 51 Convention is a sacred document in human rights. It is a great landmark. And there was a considerable um, interest in, among some of the participants, including myself, to say, let's leave that sacred document just as it is and then create another category with a separate chapter for forced migrants. So the people who are fleeing civil wars and generalized violence and, and uh, starvation and drought, even though we would give them pretty much the same rights as refugees, we would leave that 51 convention sacred and intact and untouched. And this is something very important to UNHCR, I should say. Uh, despite the fact that that's where I was leaning to go, uh, the vast majority of the room, uh, the experts felt differently. They said that for the sake of coherence, let's fully integrate and understand that forced migrants are the bigger general category and that refugees fleeing those specific forms of persecution for you know, race, religion, etc., they're, they're a subset uh, uh, and nothing more than that. Now, this was a pretty radical move, uh, but uh, uh, my, my position was overwhelmed by some very uh, impressive scholars of refugee law, and that was their choice. And that's what you'll see in the treaty right now. So our friends at UNHCR will not be happy, but this was the judgment, overwhelming majority judgment, 
of that group of experts who were assembled in the room. So that was a, a case that was difficult. On um, the old brain drain issue, remember this is a, a legal framework, a treaty that's designed to have rights and duties and uh, solve some policy questions by embedding them in rights and duties, but it's not a substitute for a, uh, a well-managed world of migration and, the mo and refugee protection. We create a treaty body to help deal with policy questions, and there's going to be plenty out there like that. And we didn't think to embed either a prohibition of people leaving to get a job elsewhere. You were not suggesting that, I know. It's a fundamental human right to leave. Uh, nor a ban on importing them by, by, by countries that wanted to recruit that labor, as many countries do. But there will be a real policy question, and it needs to be dealt with in a sensible, humane, and mutually productive way. I remember a discussion on the brain drain with a, a senior minister from uh, Ghana. And Ghana uh, is right front and center on this. Of 70% of the graduating class of nurses in the nursing school in Accra were heading to London, New York, and Paris. So it was, it was a significant issue. And we raised that with him at this point, the minister. And he said, I appreciate your concern, and yes, it has to be addressed, but let me assure you, we have plenty of Ghanaian brains to spare, and we, we do need nurses, but the brains we've got. So what he meant by that after we elaborated is that they can create another nursing school if they get the assistance to do so, and enough people will stay in Ghana to provide the health care they needed once their own health care system is working well. And so that's a policy solution uh, in terms of foreign aid. A very good way to invest foreign aid, despite all the problems with foreign aid, is investing it in education, especially like health education. And some American universities have successfully paired up with uh, hospital teaching hospitals in various parts of the poorer parts of the world for excellent programs that they enhance and expand the teaching facilities in the local country in ways that uh, are doing some of this right now. But it's a policy problem that needs to be addressed. We don't solve all the policy conundrums in the treaty, only the ones that are suitable to be put in you know, legal rights and duties terms. In the far back. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, Kind of going off that question, but more in terms of like political organization, mm -hmm. um, how would you solve the issue of so many refugees and migrants leaving an area that's so um, po in political turmoil mm -hmm. that by the time the conflict is over, there's almost no one left sort of to recreate a political organization or reestablish a more stable um, political administration? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Uh, there's a good work going on in discussing these issues in the, in the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, but not solved. Um, you know, think of Syria, for example, which has lost a very significant proportion of its population, um, especially, frankly, its more educated population uh, who are more able to flee than those who don't have some of the advantages. You know, how will Syria ever be put back together again on the assumption that it will be? It's not headed in that direction right now. But if someday there were a, peace, uh, a peaceful settlement, and, and that has implications for how you uh, support refugees and migrants. Uh, in, in, a, in an ideal world, there'd be a quick peace and, and the refugees could go back home. But that's not going to be very likely. You know, does anyone think that the refugees, the Syrian refugees, in large numbers will be going back home soon? No. But there is a, still a certain case for providing refuge uh, with the neighbors. That is, in this case, Turkey, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, but not paid for by Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon alone, as long as it has to be shared. But, and so there is a case for keeping refugees in their region under the hopes that they can someday go back home, provided their responsibility is shared globally. So it's not being paid for by those three countries. 
There is a reason for that. But even there, UNHCR has recommended time and time again, and with these populations in particular, that about 10 percent of those refugees who are there should be, from a humanitarian point of view, resettled. That is, they can't have the kind of lives of family life with dignity in that particular setting. And it might be because they have special needs for health care, or it may be that they, there's no way they can practice their profession in that particular setting. And it's, it's radically unfair to remove the opportunity for them to have that kind of life. So UNHCR rec recommends about 10% have to be moved. And so we need some kind of responsibility sharing that provides resources locally where most will still likely be uh, receive refuge, but also resettlement for about 10% is the typical norm. That's the kind of sharing that's necessary. What you can't have now is the burden of providing the financing as well as the hosting is all on countries that are nearby and often much poorer than other parts of the world. That would be my take on that. Uh, yes, please, and then the gentleman over here. Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm, my name is Josita Capriati. I'm Italian, and mm -hmm. I would like to tell you what's been happening in my country and the rest of Europe mm -hmm. in the last 10 years as far as refugees are concerned. Mm. Italy, for the last 10 years, has welcomed all the migrants and refugees coming mainly from Northern Africa and not only. Mm. Many of those migrants arriving in Italy, they wanted to go to France because they had relatives there. Mm. They arrived at the border, France stopped them, also because after the terrorist attacks of two years ago, mm -hmm. Monsieur Hollande closed Schengen. Mm -hmm. Austria wants to build a, a wall at the border with Italy. Hungary doesn't even want to hear the word migrant. Mm -hmm. Angela Merkel, after the results of the elections, decide, mm -hmm. has decided now to reduce the number of migrants. Mm -hmm. So the situation is very difficult. Also because Europe is a Christian continent. Mm -hmm. Many of the migrants belong to different religions and cultures, mm -hmm. and they don't want to abide by local laws. Mm -hmm. In Italy, we have had many cases, parents who don't want their daughters to behave in a Western way, mm -hmm. and to date, Western boys. Mm -hmm. They... <coughs> The, the ones coming from Eastern African countries, they still want to perform uh, female uh, genital mutilation, which, is, which are outlawed all over Europe. Mm -hmm. Europe, Brussels didn't listen to Italy until two years ago, when the mm -hmm. migrants started arriving from Calais. Then all of a sudden, France and Great Britain woke up and they went to Brussels to talk, and Brussels paid attention. Mm -hmm. But as I said, Europe is divided. Mm -hmm. And as far as my country are con is concerned, uh, we suffer a severe recession. So many Italians are not willing to take all these migrants. There have been mm -hmm. many incidents lately in my country. Mm -hmm. And also, I disagree with you. You mm -hmm. cannot compare today's migrant situation all over the world uh, with what happened in this continent 200 years ago. America needed the yes. labor force, and they were ready to welcome everybody from mm. all over the world mm. because they needed those people. Mm. The situation now is completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Italian case, I think, is, is exemplary for the kind of welcome that uh, the Italian government early on and the local communities gave to refugees fleeing from around the world. Truly uh, impressive. Uh, I think that there's a, a fundamental mistake was made in the European context. Uh, refugees um, and those seeking refugee status have to be determined as a European matter. And instead it was all devolved to Greece, Italy, the countries that were at the borders of Europe. They were faced with uh, uh, a, a a contradictory situation whereby from a humanitarian point of view, they wanted to provide refuge, often from Syrians and others coming in. Uh, and um, on the other hand, they were not getting the assistance, the funding, the administrative support to provide genuine uh, border controls so that those who could claim refugee status could have it quickly determined and then be assisted. So all the burden then went to the border countries. At the same time, they had an incentive not to be as tough as, and do as much determination as might have been in some cases called for because they, many of them knew that these people were in transit. So they landed in Greece and started walking into the rest of Europe. 
And so that, that was a situation where everybody had moral hazard. That is, nobody who had responsibility had resources and control. And the refugee crisis in Europe is a product of that, I mean, really quite striking and sad. Not yet solved. Um, the French now have determined that anybody who did not have proper status of a certain time will be sent back to the country of first entry. So that many of the people who were previously being housed in France will be sent back to Italy or sent back to Greece. So the crisis is not over yet. The Europeans need to get their act together. Whether, whether Europe needs migrants or not, hard to say. There are some places in Europe where because of low uh, birth rates, uh, towns are being abandoned. We had a wonderful mayor that, uh, from a ger small German town at, at a meeting that we organized on the Global Mayor's Summit here in New York. And his town's population, I, I've got the figure slightly off, went from something like 17,000 to 13,000 in 15 years. And he says that our town's going to disappear unless we get some new people. And he went out and recruited, welcomed uh, Syrian refugees in 2015. And fortunately, he had the support of his federal government to make that viable. And his story is a very positive story. And the citizens of his town went out, they set up uh, frameworks to help educate the refugees in German, skilling and things such as that. So there are good stories. Where you don't get that kind of a partnership, you often get resentments of the sort that we've seen in the last election. So that would be my yeah, take on what you're raising. We need rules and regulations accepted by everybody. That's Definitely. the bottom line. There needs to be a European solution to a European problem. It shouldn't be put on the hands of Italy and Greece. No question about that. This gentleman, thank you. Yes, yeah, great. Okay, so my question is, is I'm listening to the excellence of mm -hmm. the convention as you're describing it and the model that would have its extraordinary purpose for the world. I also have heard and read a great deal about certain people and other groups that are forcing migration, have orchestrated migration for the purpose of disruption, as she's mm -hmm. talking about in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like you to comment, George Soros being one of them and various other people who have ideas of open borders and the way the world should look, who are using the excuse of migration as a way of transforming the world or countries and the mm -hmm. makeup of countries hmm. and having impacts that are potentially problematic. Hmm. How did the convention deal with suggestions like that, which are real in terms of people describing them? Mm -hmm. Hungary obviously taking a tough position on it in various other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you, what, what's your comment on things like that? Because what you're talking about in terms mm. of the significance of migration also leads to the possibility of disruption that, that impacts a lot of people yeah. and countries. Um, you know, in, any country that engages in forced migration as either a geopolitical tactic designed to disrupt another country is, you know, violating... Uh, very basic international laws that are covered on the criminal side. That is, the Rome Statute prohibits as a crime against humanity any, any country that is forcibly expelling its own people, whether for a strategic purpose or either domestic, that is getting rid of potential insurgents or at least opposition, or for an international purpose. So that's all ruled out you know, pretty thoroughly by the Rome Statute. Uh, we're, we're working on the basis that uh, uh, we're seeking to protect the rights of those people who have been expelled and have been uh, forced from their homes. So we're trying to protect their rights and to find a way to do so in the, in the context that will allow states to also maintain the security of their borders and the control over those borders. But for those individuals, and there were allegations recently in some of the Middle East conflicts that there were concerted efforts to put pressure uh, 
uh, on Europe in the way that you describe. I don't have any inside knowledge on that. But that would be covered by uh, crimes against humanity in the Rome Statute. And in a better world, the people who did it would be prosecuted. Uh, that's, we're gonna have, we can't hold our breath for that to happen, given the outcome of the wars there, though. Yes, please. Um, Professor Doyle, thank you so much for the insightful presentation and for sharing um, ideas on the initiative of the Convention on Migration, which I find really exciting. Uh, I'm one of the global engagement students, and I also am interning at the United Nations and happen to follow the mm -hmm. Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you to provide some comments mm -hmm. on what you think about this initiative, uh, about the global compact itself, mm -hmm. on how effective you think it will be when it gets adopted, and also maybe additionally if you could comment on the um, format of the document since it's it's called compact, which is not a treaty, it's mm -hmm. not a resolution. Right. So what would be legal implications of this new format of the document? So how mm -hmm. effective will it be in the future? Thank mm -hmm. you. No, I think you've, you've described it very nicely. Um, it's designed to uh, provide what's called guidelines for managing um, in a humane way and in a way that reflects the rights of the people and states, the movement of people across borders uh, that are designed to make this movement safe, orderly, and regular. That's the, that's the set of principles that one is leaning towards. The governments that authorized uh, the negotiation of this compact were very clear in rejecting the possibility of new legal commitments. So this, this will be guidelines and principles. That said, the word compact has some hope attached to it. A compact is something bigger than a contract, okay? Uh, less than a constitution. Uh, we, the American citizens in the room here, when you hear the word compact, you think of the Mayflower compact. It's when groups of people are pledging to do things that will make their lives in some way or another better, okay? That's the resonance in American English that the word compact brings to us. And I, I, I can't speak for the negotiators who wrote it, though one of them indicated that, that some of those things were in his mind, but also that they just came up on the word. So it's not clear how, uh, how intentional the, cho the choice of the word compact is. But what is clear is it's not a legal commitment and is designed to be guidelines and principles for action that, that countries will pledge to each other to cooperate. Now, what the content is yet to be determined, uh, a very eminent uh, Canadian jurist, uh, Louise Arbour, also the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, is leading this effort uh, on, the, on behalf of the Secretary General. And then Switzerland and Mexico are the co-facilitators. There's meetings taking place around the world. They're hoping to produce something that's serious, that uh, will provide genuine answers to some of the questions we have about how migration can be made safer, more orderly, and more regular with better rules. And so uh, we're working with them indirectly. Uh, the team uh, that we have, our migration group at the Global Policy Initiative, to put in ideas, write papers, things such as that. So we're hopeful. But in the end, this is gonna be a political process. Deals will be cut amongst the member states and they'll decide how ambitious to be or how pusillanimous to be. <laughs> It'll be one, and on that spectrum, they will come to some arrangement. So it's yet to be determined. We're not gonna know what that's gonna look like until late fall of this year. And we'll have some inklings at that point what's gonna come out of it. If no one else has questions, I have one more question, Please. actually. Yes, of course. So um, you said that you had a um, uh, you had a definition that might actually mm -hmm. be in ma making United Nations High Commissioner, for, you know, UNHCR not so happy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if you don't have a buy-in from mm -hmm. your 
closest ally, mm -hmm. right? How do you expect to have a buy-in from the states that are already um, resistant, right? So what is the strategic, like uh, as a, a, I'm a strategist, mm -hmm. this is like my mind goes, okay, what is the next step? How do we make this happen, mm -hmm. right? So what is the strategic um, mm -hmm. move to kind of have a buy-in from uh, UNHCR and maybe ILO and some of mm -hmm. those organizations that yeah. might? Um, I would backpedal just a moment and say that UNHCR doesn't want anyone to touch the 51 convention. Right. Not in, and I can't speak for them, but I'm just reading tea leaves now. Not in their heart of hearts because they don't want to expand protection to people fleeing civil wars or generalized violence or starvation or right. anything else that puts one's life at risk. They have, with incredible versatility, uh, expanded the meaning of that 51 convention with a whole series of regular reports and regulations and directives that they produce on an annual basis. So if, if I could speak, I would say in their heart of hearts, they are sympathetic to the agenda that we're doing here. What concerns them, and this is why what concerned me, is that in the current political environment that we're in, uh, if we suddenly handed this to the member states of the world, I'm not sure we could reproduce the 51 convention. And so they're worried about uh, rollback of a series of rights and protections. And I think that's a reasonable concern. Nonetheless, for the sake of coherence, we decided to move forward in the way that we've done. Uh, so how will change take place? Well, you know, in, in the back of our mind, you know, if, uh, if, if you want to know what our moonshot is, you know, the, the daydream ambition that we have, it's what happened with the landmines process. That is, a bunch of NGOs got together, wrote some drafts of a, of a landmine convention, a model. Uh, uh, they went around and pushed for it for a long time and met immense skepticism, especially by the countries that use landmines and produce them, but others as well. And after a number of years, they eventually found a friendly government, Canada. And Canada then called an international conference and with a lot of good diplomacy, mobilized enough countries that we now have a landmine convention. It hasn't solved the problem of landmines yet, but it did create a legal framework that's designed to delegitimize landmines as an ordinary weapon of war. So that was uh, the process. So if I could imagine 10 years from to now, you know, which is roughly how long it took in the landmines process, we will have built support uh, in NGOs, places like Amnesty, places like Human Rights Watch, uh, with uh, corporations like IKEA, and I could run down a number of others who have moved forward to provide support for refugees and migrants. We will discover some sympathetic governments, a few at the beginning, and eventually, hopefully, somewhere, you know, you know 2027, 20, uh, we'll reach a, a tipping point where a group of governments will say, we think something more coherent could be done for migration. And here's a, a starting point. What we have written in this treaty is nothing more than input. The governments will make sausages out of what we have done here on their own with all of the compromises that are part of what a regular treaty making process is like. But this would have been useful input. We will have shown how a, what a coherent regime could look like and we will have addressed some difficulties in language that I hope that they would find useful. But again, we're, it's 10 years out that in my view that before we will get traction, and then only if we succeed between now and then in mobilizing support. That that would be my take on that question. Should you, should you take one more question? One more question. The, the lady back there. Oh, and two two more questions. I, I don't know who was first. <laughs> Please. So, apropos of what you were just speaking about, mm -hmm. as far as a time frame mm -hmm. for bringing this, some of this to fruition. Do you have any thoughts about any components of this model mm -hmm. that might be short-term agreements mm -hmm. that could be affected much more readily and much more mm -hmm. uh, unanimously, if you will, among mm -hmm. some of these member yes. states yeah. where you could work on it that way rather yes. than... 
Exactly. I mean, there are a lot of steps in between. We're, we're meeting with the, uh, the people who are putting together the global com compacts on refugees and on migration. We're hoping that they will find interesting material here. There are some things that are uh, very attractive to countries that are otherwise not yet sympathetic. You know, again, you know, machine readable biometric passports, that would it itself be a positive step forward. And, uh, you know, the U.S. is strongly behind that. The EU is strongly behind that. You know, these are these are measures that could certainly be taken somewhere much, much sooner than the more ambitious parts of responsibility sharing, et cetera. But we but we do want to make sure um, that we put together a package and that uh, the improvement in the legal regime for migration is more symmetrical. It's not just driven by the interest of the powerful and the rich states. It also solves some of the problems, the 84% of the world's refugees that are now being housed in developing countries. But that'll be much more difficult. There'll be immense pushback from the powerful on that kind of a change. But we want to keep pushing in that direction. And uh, we'd still like to see a package whereby there are benefits that are being distributed in ways that address the real problems. So, but yes, there are smaller steps that are certainly there. Yes, please. Hi. Um, going off of your idea of um, shared responsibility, mm -hmm. did you have any discussion on the future of refugee camps, especially the ones where people have li been living there for the majority of their lives? Um, and do you see a vision of like those, those types of refugee camps continuing mm -hmm. or more along the lines of like integration or resettlement? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a hard, it's a very difficult issue. Um, overall, it's, it's, usually better for refugees if they can live in a more integrated setting, that is live in existing towns and villages, work, you know, et cetera. Uh, that's usually better for them. But there are countries that are very concerned about what this kind of, uh, of what, what is seen for some as an invasion of foreigners into the country can do. And so some of those countries will insist upon encampment. This is being played out as we speak right now with the Rohingya in Southeast Asia. Encampment or integration, there's this big, this big discussion going on right now on these issues. So there really are competing claims there. They're gonna be worked out in, um, uh, in different ways, in different regions, needless to say. The key thing is to, number one, not assume that a refugee displacement is going to be quickly solved. And so what, whether encampments or integrated, you're going to have to find education, jobs, health care, et cetera, for the refugees under the view that they will be there for a considerable period of time. And it has to be done, we think, in a way that makes sure that the local population also benefits from any assistance that goes to the refugees. If it's not a win-win, you, you are doing number one, harm, and number two, creating an unsustainable situation. And there have been some areas where there have been a win-win that is a, a model, but it has to be designed to fit the local circumstances. But those policy issues are front and center and extremely important and playing out as we speak, for example, in a number of places around the world. Professor Doyle, we want to thank you. It's it's never a disappointing uh, experience to hear you speak, um, even though you speak about very, very difficult subjects. It's always a hopeful ending looking into the future. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. And the one favor I would ask of everybody is to go to our website and see if you like the treaty. Thank you. <laughs>